Sunny Smiles immediately tutorializes shooting, iron sight aiming. Fallout 3 manages to get around this problem of iron sight aiming by not having any iron sights to aim. Your only option outside of VATS is to essentially hip fire your gun. And that works out okay at point blank range, but good luck trying to snipe over long sight lines. Probably the worst example of this is the hunting rifle. A rifle is supposed to be a long range weapon, but with no sights to aim with, you are forced to spray and pray. Spraying and praying with a slow firing bolt action rifle just isn't very fun. I'll likely come back to this later on because further on in the video you praise this inability to aim as if it were a positive thing. Yes, combat is slightly clunky in Fallout 3, and that's good because Fallout 3 isn't a shooter, it's an action RPG. And because your character isn't a soldier, they're a teenager from a sheltered environment whose only experience of gunplay is their BB rifle. You say your character grew up in a vault, so it makes sense they would be clumsy with a gun. But there's several problems with that. First, even though you did grow up in the vault, you are given a BB gun and taught how to shoot it. And who knows how many times you've practiced with it in the years since then. So you do have some experience with a gun, and not being allowed to roleplay your character as being a competent rifleman is needlessly restricting your character. Also, this is not the reason that Bethesda made the gunplay so clunky. They didn't do this by design. It's this way because they are incompetent game developers. And Fallout 3 is just a reskin of Oblivion. Which by the way did not have any guns in it at all. So guns had to be grafted onto the Oblivion engine with duct tape and bailing wire. Kinda like what is holding these shitty hunting rifles together. In Oblivion, your arrow and magical projectile attacks could only be crudely aimed, just like in Fallout 3. So the gunplay in Fallout 3 works very much like how it does in Oblivion with the ranged attacks. Bethesda just shoehorned it in when they reskinned the game. Hence why Fallout 3 is literally Oblivion with guns. And I'm using the word literally in a very correct sense here, because Fallout 3 still retains remnants of the Oblivion code it is built upon. People talk about New Vegas reusing assets from Fallout 3. Well, Fallout 3 itself is reusing the engine of Oblivion. So what about that? Aside from the inclusion of iron sights, New Vegas improves on the gunplay of Fallout 3 by having more gun variety the addition of different ammunition types, and the ability to break down and reload ammo at reloading benches. Most ammunition types have multiple variants. Take, for example, shotgun shells. In Fallout 3, you only had shotgun shells and that was it. But in New Vegas, you have, depending on which sort of shotgun you're using, 20 gauge and 12 gauge shotgun shells. These are each broken down into various types with pros and cons for each one. There is even a hand loader perk which is required in order to unlock some of these. This makes such a character build very rewarding. You can't do that in Fallout 3, can you? One might think that with New Vegas showing how much better and more nuanced firearms could be, that Bethesda would learn from that and include at least some of these innovative mechanics into Fallout 4, right? Well, they didn't. Aside from the gunplay being a lot better thanks to the help of id Software, Fallout 4 is actually a step backwards from New Vegas in this regard. Reloading benches are gone, and once again you are limited to just one basic type of ammunition for each weapon. No more armor piercing or hollow point rounds for you. But we're not talking about how Fallout 4 downgraded from New Vegas while still improving in other areas. We're talking about Fallout 3 and how abysmal the gunplay in it is. I've already talked at length about how Fallout 3 fails as an RPG, but it also fails as a first person shooter as well. Even in its time, you had Call of Duty, Battlefield, Medal of Honor, and all those other FPS games. No one in their right mind would play Fallout 3 because they think it is a great first person shooter. The one and only positive thing Fallout 3 has going for it is the cinematic, over the top violence of VATS. 
Who's laughing now? Later on in the video, you say Vats never gets old. And that's a good thing for Fallout 3, because that's the only crutch it has to stand on. Crouching in order to shoot better, sneaking to get close to things that you want to shoot, the skill checks don't come into the game until quite a bit down the line. The skill checks come into the game before you even leave Doc Mitchell's house for the very first time. With a high enough science skill, you can use the lab to whip up some chems, and there's also a broken 9mm SMG on a Sunset Sarsaparilla crate, which you can fix if you have a high enough repair skill. There are also speech checks with Doc Mitchell himself, where he will give you additional stim packs if you have high enough speech and or medicine skill. Of course. You've been through a lot. It ain't much, but these will do you right if the pain flares up. Of course. You've been through a lot. It ain't much, but these will do you right if the pain flares up. Even after leaving Doc Mitchell's house, the tutorial is optional, as I said. You could go anywhere and do anything before doing it, or even never do it at all. But, even within the area of Good Springs itself, there are a number of skill checks that a player would very likely encounter before meeting Sunny Smiles. I'll give you a couple examples. In the schoolhouse, there's a locked safe and a terminal. With either science or lockpicking, you can get into that safe. And there's a lot of cool loot in there, including a super stim pack and a stealth boy. And that stealth boy is something you can use to sneak past those Cazadors north of Good Springs, which you say are impossible to get past at level 1. LOL. Sunny herself even directs you to the schoolhouse if you ask her if there is any work in the town. Not in Good Springs, no. But if you're up for a little scavenging, there's always the schoolhouse. Most of what's in there is junk, but there's this old safe that even Easy Pete wasn't able to crack with dynamite. If you want to take a shot at it, take these. And Easy Pete, whom you encounter even before you enter the saloon, mentions the schoolhouse, so it wouldn't even take random exploring for a new player to stumble upon it because the place is mentioned by at least two characters. All of these skill checks are non-combat skills, and all of them can be useful to getting past the Cazadors north of Good Springs. The submachine gun, the stealth boy, and all the healing items and chems make going that way very much doable at level 1, yet you say it's impossible. Consider New Vegas, with a solid wall to the west and Cazadors in a narrow canyon to the north, who may as well be a brick wall to level 1 characters. I thought you were supposed to be some sort of expert at the game. How do you not know this stuff? You supposedly, allegedly, completed these games without ever dying, but yet you don't know that there are all these skill checks? Come on. You are either deliberately lying in order to manipulate your viewers, or you're just plain stupid. Which one is it? Either way, why are you slandering New Vegas anyway? Your video is supposed to be about how Fallout 3 is supposedly better than you think. Why don't you stick to that instead of being negative and lying about a separate game? You're supposed to be positive towards Fallout 3, not negative towards New Vegas. Is being negative towards New Vegas the only way you can be positive towards Fallout 3? Is Fallout 3 really that bad? Because that's the impression I'm getting. Fallout 3 is better than you think is a poorly made, badly researched video full of lies and misinformation. Remember what you said on Reddit about Kretosis? You say all this shit about how negative he is, how negativity is his brand, and so on, and at the same time claiming you like people being positive, but you yourself are very negative. You take every possible opportunity to shit on New Vegas, even resorting to fabricating lies about it. Please, do remind us again how the skill checks don't come into the game until quite a bit down the line as you put it. And go ahead and make a Reddit post explaining how negative I am, and how negativity is my brand, like you did to Kretosis. And you know what? Maybe I am negative, but so are you.
Now this is where I start getting a tiny bit confused. Only a tiny bit confused? Sounds like you've improved from the enormously confused that you normally are. I'll give you an example. Get nice and close, 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 nice and close. Hello! I've got- I know how VATS works. I've got a pulse grenade for you. I really hope this does some good work. I invested in flipping- Oh no! Now, I have no formal military training, but I'm pretty certain that Close, nice and close, nice and close, nice and close. That is not what you want to do when it comes to dealing with hand grenades. Running up close to enemies at point-blank range and then standing there like a deer in the headlights as you attempt to aim the grenade and directly hit them, as opposed to just letting the splash damage do its thing, is really not the right way to do it. The nice thing about grenades is you don't even need a line of sight with the enemy in order to use them. You could just toss it or let it bounce or roll around the corner. Had you done that, you wouldn't have died right there like you did. Please, remind us again about your so-called YOLO series and how all the edits weren't really just full of moments exactly like this one. Because the criticism I see over and over about Fallout 3 is there's no freedom, there's no choice, there are no skill check resolutions, there's no opportunity to roleplay. But Fallout 3's tutorial section seems to be trying to provide exactly that. Well, it can't be trying too hard considering how linear it is. There are no branching paths whatsoever. Contrast this with the Sunny Smiles tutorial, which, if nothing else, is completely optional, and even if you do opt into doing it, you can end it immediately once you've completed the part where you shoot the bottles. Accompanying Sunny on the Gecko Hunt is an optional phase to the tutorial, and participating in it can potentially result in an unnamed Good Spring Settler dying, but you can also save her. And if you do save her, you gain reputation and some purified water. This woman is an unnamed NPC, but compare and contrast her with Officer Kendall and the other Vault 101 security guards. Though these guards do have a name, you cannot talk to them, and they are eternally hostile towards you. Doesn't it say a lot that an unnamed character in New Vegas has more depth and nuance than an actually named character in Fallout 3 does? And the Gecko Hunt isn't even the end of Sunny's tutorial. It then proceeds to another phase, where she teaches you how to make healing powder at a campfire. This showcases a major new innovative feature New Vegas introduced, which Fallout 3 did not have at all. Many critics of New Vegas love to point out that the Mojave is a desert, but even though that is true, this desert actually has a lot more life to it than the East Coast desert of the Capital Wasteland. There are actually plants in the Mojave that you can harvest, and you can craft and cook with them at a campfire using the new survival skill, which again, Fallout 3 did not have. And Sunny Smiles introduces players to this wonderful new mechanic that Obsidian introduced, which makes New Vegas seem like a real, authentic, post-apocalyptic wasteland game, as opposed to an apocalyptic amusement park where people live off pre-war junk food and nothing else. Let me see what you got. Yeah, these will do just fine. Just fine. All right now, we're gonna be making something folks on the trail call healing powder. Go on over to that campfire now. Give it a try. And it gets even better in Escape. Even better, you say? After that sweet roll quest at the birthday party, I didn't think the game could possibly get any better. Which contains some really interesting and pretty unique ideas. For example, at the start of Escape, a martyr offers you a gun. You can decline it and insist that she keeps it, which goes into have consequences down the line, not just for you, but for her in the interrogation scene. Actually, I'd say it's more a consequence for that vault guard she guns down. He is the one who just had his life taken. Does it make any difference to her that she just took a man's life? Does that have any psychological impact on her that plays a role in her character development when you see her again later during Trouble on the Homefront? Whether it's you that gunned down Officer Mac or her, does it make any difference to anyone? I tried to do the vault escape in the most pacifistic way possible, so I let Amada keep the gun. 
But I didn't get this outcome because you say that running away is a valid option. But what that means in practice is that you have a bunch of hostile guards that can't be talked down chasing your ass through the entire vault. So when I got to that interrogation room, the whole thing got interrupted and Amada was able to escape without having to shoot Officer Mac and I now have a hostile Officer Mac chasing after me along with all the other guards. You say letting Amada keep the gun has consequences not just for me, but for her as well, but in reality it didn't have any consequences for either of us, because it just resulted in yet another hostile guard chasing after me. But this is what you claim is a pacifist solution to the vault escape. But since I didn't get this outcome, where Amada's legs flop around like wet noodles, as she does some sort of bizarre dance, I had to cheat and look on the Fallout wiki to see if killing Officer Mac had any impact on her psychologically or in any other way, and apparently it doesn't. She isn't traumatized by taking a human life, and unless I'm missing something, this man is apparently never mentioned by anyone ever again. He is nothing more than a cardboard cutout for you or Amada to shoot at. If he isn't killed, he will reappear later in Trouble on the Homefront, but he doesn't play any role in it, so whether he lives or dies ultimately doesn't matter beyond his own existence. It doesn't have any impact on any quests, Three Dog doesn't mention him on the radio, and he isn't in any of the end slides narrated by Ron Perlman. He may as well be one of the rad roaches for how little he matters. But Bethesda did take the time to give him a name, though. Officer Mac has a name, and the Good Spring Settler in Sonny's tutorial doesn't. But the nameless Good Spring Settler actually matters. She matters because there are only so many ways to gain faction reputation, and saving her life is one of those few ways. But nobody cares about Officer Mac. So really, the only consequences of letting Amada keep the gun is that you get to watch the comical spectacle of her flopping around like a marionette dangled by its strings. This is the only entertaining thing I've seen in the entire vault intro, so I'm kind of surprised that you didn't even comment on it at all. When she normally needs to be rescued... She doesn't need to be rescued. She is an essential, immortal demigod. Neither the player, nor the rad roaches, nor the vault guards can do anything to her. The worst thing that can possibly happen to her is having her feelings hurt by the tunnel snakes, or getting knocked unconscious. But neither of those things have any long-term impact on her. When you encounter her later on in Trouble on the Homefront, she doesn't mention being bullied, no matter what choice you might have made there. Even if you took the evil path of telling Butch she is sensitive about her weight. This is what happens when you have too much personality. Ah! Oh. All right, all right. Recovering, recovery mode. Ah! Must recover. Ah! I just don't think I can take much more. Oh, oh that's just. It's like a evil Chung Li. Or some sort of deformed cosplay. Oh. Why? I don't know. One more. And out. Oh, Alright, we're done. It doesn't have any lasting long-term impact on her or her opinion of you. Neither does knocking her unconscious. In my playthrough, where I just ran away, which Matten presents as a pacifist solution, the hostile guards chased me all the way to the exit of the vault, and Amada was there, and when they weren't able to harm me, they began to attack her. Keep in mind, I allowed her to keep the gun, so she should be using that to defend herself, like you pointed out she does during the interrogation when she flops around like cooked spaghetti, but she doesn't. She just stands there and absorbs the damage until she is knocked unconscious. Then eventually she regains consciousness and then the guards proceed to attack her until she is knocked unconscious once again. This repeats over and over for eternity because she is an immortal demigod and cannot die. She is 
not unlike the Titan Prometheus from Greek mythology, who was punished by Zeus for sharing the gift of fire with mankind. Prometheus was chained to a rock, and every day an eagle would come and eat his liver, which would then grow back, and this would repeat for eternity. That's Amada's fate, I suppose, because there's nothing I can do about it. This goes to show the downside of immortality. And then Butch shows up and asks you to save his mother from rad roaches because he's scared of them. Sure you can refuse because he bullied you, or jump in and save her. Or you can have it both ways, by jumping in and saving her, and then killing her. You gain karma by saving her, and then lose karma from killing her, and it seems to balance out. Just make sure to talk to Butch after saving her and before killing her so he will give you his tunnel snakes jacket. And if he doesn't see you kill her, then he won't turn hostile towards you, though he will lament the fact that his mother has died. She's dead! She's dead and you could have helped and you didn't! Get away from me! Just go away and leave me alone! Just go away and leave me alone! By the way, something very strange I've noticed when I killed Ellen Deloria is that she seems to have a mountain of hit points. I could tell this because of how many hits from the baseball bat it took to kill her compared to the Vault 101 security guards. Looking at the Fallout wiki, it says she has 120 hit points. Compare and contrast this with the Vault security guards. For example, here are the statistics for Officer Mack. During Trouble on the home front, he only has 55 hit points, which is less than half the amount of hit points Ellen has. And during the Escape tutorial, he only has a piddly 31 hit points. Am I the only one who thinks this is very strange? Ellen Deloria is a middle-aged alcoholic, but she is four times as powerful as the Vault security guards, who are younger and presumably more physically fit than she is. According to the wiki, Officer Mack is only 25 years old. Ellen is probably twice his age. The Gek puts her as an old character. Why is she four times more powerful than a man half her age? This man should be in his prime, at peak physical condition, but he explodes into giblets from just a single swipe of a knife, as H-Bomb showed in his video. My old friend, I've come to talk with you again. No wonder Officer Kindle died to the Rad Roaches when I ran past him in my playthrough after following Matten's advice. These vault security guards are a joke. Who in their right mind thinks this is good game design? Let me tell you, it isn't. Not only can the vault security guards not take any amount of damage, but they barely dish any damage out themselves. Mere rad roaches easily kick their ass, and the lone wanderer may as well be Mehrun's Dagon to them. Keep in mind, I played this game on very hard difficulty, but there's nothing very hard about it. Remember what you said about what the developers choose to tutorialize shows what they think the core gameplay elements are? Well, apparently, non-challenging enemies is one of those things. Now don't get me wrong, death claws in this game are pretty tough, and so are some of the other enemies. But those are side content enemies. Anything to do with the main plot of the game, whether it be vault security guards or enclave, they are a joke. During the final mission, you have a giant OP robot and an army of Brotherhood of Steel in power armor to do all the fighting for you, and the game moves forward without the player having to do anything. You can just walk with your hands in your pockets, and you can get through this tutorial without any real challenge. And the same goes for the final mission. What makes this even more funny is that Ellen Deloria isn't even wearing armor, but the security guards are, for what little good that does them. Armor seems to be mostly cosmetic in this game. Even enemies in power armor go down pretty easily. It's as if, instead of real power armor, they're just wearing Halloween costumes. But that's something I'll address much later on in more detail when I get to the part where you praise the armor mechanic in Fallout 3 as if it weren't horrible. Well, let me say right now, it is horrible. You praise it 
citing that it makes the player character more vulnerable since armor can't help them as much. But you know who else isn't helped by the shitty armor Fallout 3 has? All of the enemies in the game. The game would actually be far more of a challenge if the big bad Enclave actually had armor that was worth a shit rather than armor that is apparently made of styrofoam. Butch's mom wears a Vault 101 jumpsuit, which has a DR of only one, but she's a juggernaut compared to the security guards. But the really interesting option is the speech check where you can persuade him to save her by arming him with your old BB gun. Because he's just run up to you and tried to give you a quest to do, and your response is to empower him to complete the quest by himself. And does Butch completing the quest by himself have any impact on anything whatsoever? Does it change his character in any way? Does this have any effect on whether you can recruit him as a companion later on? Does it get referenced in an end slide by Ron Perlman? Does it have any influence on trouble on the home front later on in the game? If the answer to all of these questions is a resounding no, then really this is just as pointless as the sweet roll at your birthday party, or when he bullied Amada. It's also very unlikely for Miss Deloria to perish to the Radroaches, or anything, considering the mountain of hit points she has. I mean, I'm sure the Radroaches would kill her eventually, but you could already be disarming the bomb in Megaton by the time it would take for that to happen. But, even if Miss Deloria somehow dies in this tutorial, whether it's by the Radroaches or by the player, it ultimately doesn't mean anything other than to determine whether she reappears during Trouble on the Homefront later on. She has no impact on that quest or anything else in the entire game. Although Butch is upset if she dies, it does not have any impact on whether he can be recruited as a companion later on. She is treated as a disposable character, just like Jonas, all of the vault security guards, and the vast majority of NPCs in the game. You can murder her, and Butch could even know that you murdered her, and he is still willing to join you as a companion later on, just so long as you have neutral karma. That's how little his mother matters to him. You can go and help or watch after that, but you don't have to. You can just run off. Well, to be fair, you can just run off regardless. Also, if you sneak through the restrooms, you can bypass Butch entirely and not have to talk with him or interact with him at all. You've just persuaded an NPC to sort out their own mess. Again, I tried to think of another example of this anywhere in Fallout, and I couldn't think of one. Persuading an NPC to sort out their own mess? You can't think of any other examples of this? Seriously? What about all the companion quests in New Vegas where you do exactly that? You persuade Boone to come to terms with his inner demons. You also do kind of the same thing with female Boone, where you can persuade her to seek treatment from Dr. Usanagi. And what about Benny at Caesar's Fort? You can optionally give him a stealth boy and a bobby pin, and he uses those to sort out his mess of being held captive, just like how Butch uses the BB gun if you give it to him. How is it any different? It astounds me that you can't think of any other examples of this when New Vegas is packed full of such examples. Maybe they're not so common in Fallout 3, Maybe that's why this example in the Vault tutorial stands out so much, because maybe there's nothing else like it in the entire rest of Fallout 3. It's great that Fallout 3 has this one example, but it's too bad it doesn't follow that up with anything else. At least not anything else that is very memorable, since apparently neither one of us can think of any. New Vegas' first proper quest, Ghost Town Gunfight, is somewhat similar, as you can ensure the town is armed and well armoured, but even then, the quest remains centred around you, the fight doesn't trigger until you're there to trigger it. That's pretty much every single quest in every RPG that exists, with only very few exceptions. Officer Kendall doesn't come under attack by Radroaches until the player character turns around the corner and triggers a scripted event. The same goes with Butch and the Radroaches. I haven't tested it, but I bet that if you bypass talking to Butch and exit the vault without saving his mom, later on she will be there, alive, during Trouble on the Homefront, as if you had saved her. 
Criticizing New Vegas because Ghost Town Gunfight doesn't trigger until the player character locks it in by talking to Ringo seems like a very bizarre nitpick to make. Name some events that are triggered in games without being triggered by the player. The only thing I can think of offhand are timed events, such as in Fallout 1 where you had a deadline to find the water chip, and if you didn't, then the game would end in a failure. Aside from that, Events don't seem to happen unless the player character triggers them to happen in a certain way. Later on in the video, you slam the New Vegas intro narration by Ron Perlman because it provides exposition about the first Battle of Hoover Dam, an event which happened outside the time the game is set. That's an example of an event happening that isn't centered around the player, although, then again, we really can't say that the courier didn't play a, a role in that, now can we? But you condemn this. It seems like New Vegas just can't win with you either way. You either shit on the game because events don't happen until the player triggers them, something that is true in almost every game that exists, but on the other hand, you also slam the game for providing exposition on historical events that did not involve the player character in any way. The escape itself has plenty of options too. The overseer's door can be opened with the lockpick skill, or you can steal the key from his bedroom, or you can threaten to badly hurt a martyr if he doesn't comply and give you access. Wait a minute. Didn't the overseer order Officer Mac to beat Amada during the interrogation? So let's break this down. As you make your escape through the vault, you pass by the interrogation room, where you see the overseer ordering his henchmen to brutally beat his own daughter with a nightstick. So you rush into the room in order to save her, and the way you manage to talk him down is by threatening to beat the very same person, his own daughter, whom he was ordering to be beaten even at the same time you show up. Am I the only one who sees the contradiction here? Yet another example of abysmal writing by Emil Pagliarulo. Why does the lone wanderer threatening to hurt Amada scare him? when he is more than happy to order Officer Mac to do exactly that. Because what the devs choose to tell us first shows us what they think the core gameplay elements are. So I guess this is the part of the tutorial where the devs show us that one of the core gameplay elements of Fallout 3 is badly written characters that stand for nothing and turn on a dime. Later on in the game, Colonel Autumn does the exact same thing. And so does President Eden when he blows up Raven Rock by self-destructing on a dime. Beyond that, there's a science shit you can skip if you choose to thoroughly search the rooms as well. Okay, Anthony Sullivan. Yes, there are options, and all of those options produce the exact same outcome. This is yet another example of you praising something about Fallout 3 that is almost universally viewed as a negative. Pick a lock, hack a terminal, grab the password from a drawer, all options lead to the same outcome. What makes it even worse is that the lock picking and hacking are very easy, which means anyone can do it no matter how they built their character in the baby book and the goat test. Very easy locks and terminals require zero skill in order to do. Had these been easy, as opposed to very easy, then either one would have required 25 points, which some builds might have, depending on how they were built and what skills were tagged, but it wouldn't just be a given that anyone and everyone could do it. Compare and contrast this with the 9mm SMG in Doc Mitchell's house or the chemistry set. You flat out lie through your teeth and say skill checks don't exist until quite a bit down the line. But these do exist, despite your lying and slander. And these are easy skill checks, as opposed to very easy. The distinction is that everyone can do very easy skill checks, but only certain builds can do easy skill checks at level 1. And this affects the start of New Vegas. Not only does Doc Mitchell have customized responses depending on your stats, but these skills can be used immediately in the Good Springs area to get your character off to a great start and do things such as go north past those Kazdors, which you lie and say are a brick wall to 
to level one characters. Well, those skill checks you claim don't exist can help you tear down that brick wall. I honestly do not believe you are as dumb as you act like you are. I think you are being disingenuous. You have so little self-respect that you're willing to make yourself look like an idiot by pretending to be dumb just so you can make an argument that you know is false. I'm sure that deep down you fully agree that these aren't real choices. What really matters to you is deceiving your audience. While you yourself aren't dumb enough to believe that these are actual choices, unfortunately, a large percentage of your audience is another story. Congratulations on manipulating them with your lies, Matten. You've passed some sort of real-life skill check by doing that. Fallout 3's message here is clear. Explore thoroughly and you'll find alternative solutions. And all of those solutions have the same outcome, so what does it matter? Also, you don't have to explore too thoroughly since the Overseer's office isn't very big and the lockers are right next to the terminal. There's actually very, very little exploring you are able to do during the escape tutorial since the vast majority of doors are inaccessible. Which, again, seems to be exactly what people claim that they want out of a Fallout game. People want choice and consequences. They want the replay value of getting a different experience based on the choices they made. A lot of games make a big deal out of player choice, but few in recent memory offer so many intricate ways of approaching any given situation. In Fallout 3, developer Bethesda Softworks' latest role-playing game, these choices aren't just illusory branches of dialogue. You'll fulfill or dash the spiritual hopes of an entire society, side with slavers or their slaves, and decide the fate of more than one city over the course of your journey through the Washington, D.C. wasteland. Your actions have far-reaching consequences that affect not just the world around you, but also the way you play. And it's this freedom that makes Fallout 3 worth playing and replaying. Do you really get excited over the different choices of how you open up the Overseer's Tunnel? Are you excited to play and replay Fallout 3's tutorial, wondering what it would be like to pick the lock instead of hack the terminal? Do these choices add any replay value? They all lead to the exact same linear outcome, which is that the tunnel opens up and you make your escape. How you do it makes absolutely zero fucking difference. And that's why people go to great lengths to mod the opening out. It's horrible. Even people who generally like Fallout 3 and defend it don't tend to defend this tutorial. Why do you defend it? You say that letting Amada keep the gun or giving the BB gun to Butch are both interesting solutions. How so when there aren't any unique consequences for these solutions compared to any other solution? Absolutely nothing in this tutorial, other than the choice of killing the Overseer or not, has any consequences whatsoever. Well, I'll be a bit more fair and say that killing Butch also has consequences, because you lose the potential to have him as a companion later on if he dies. But, even being a companion, he's little more than a pack mule with a gun. Pretty much the same as all companions in Fallout 3, really. Fallout 3 doesn't really have real companions, just pack mules with guns. New Vegas has real companions, people you can talk to and you can work to build trust with and unlock their companion quests. Fallout 3 doesn't have that, New Vegas does. You know, that game you constantly shit on in your video? Anyway, let's say Butch also matters, though really he doesn't because he's just a pack mule with a gun, and there's plenty of other pack mules with guns in this game to choose from. That tiny little knife of his isn't going to be of much use against Death Claws anyway, to be completely honest. If you take him on as a companion, he's probably not going to survive very long. But still, him being a companion is a thing, so him dying in the tutorial has the consequence of losing that later on. But that's pretty much it. The sweet roll doesn't matter, Amada being bullied doesn't matter, the lives of the vault security guards don't matter, even the life of Butch's mother doesn't matter to her own son. He will be your companion later on regardless of whether she lives or dies. 
Now, some people also seem annoyed that you can't talk down the very first guard that attacks you at the start, but you can very easily run away from him. Too easily. And that results in his death, because he only has 31 hit points, and the shitty armor he wears is mostly just cosmetic and doesn't actually do anything. Running away and him dying isn't really a pacifist solution, now is it? The alternative is to kill the Radroaches for him, but this doesn't do a goddamn thing to stop his hostility towards you. Have you ever read Aesop's fable of the lion and the mouse? The gist of it is that a lion spares the life of a mouse, and then later on the lion gets netted by hunters, and the mouse comes and gnaws through the net and frees the lion. I've also seen an alternate version where a mouse removes a thorn from a lion's paw. Either way, the moral of the story is that a kindness is never wasted. Fallout 3, of course, shits all over this. But what would you expect from a game designer who says things like this? Who's laughing now? <laughs> or a lead writer who thinks this way. I can talk to a, a, an old lady or an old guy and have him be a character, and then I can kill him. And, you know, and really feel like I killed a person. And then I can, like, you know, pick up his head and put it on his shelf. And I look at it, and it's like, I was talking to that person five minutes ago, and now I'm not. You know, it's like, so it's that type of thing. Based on these quotes, one could get the impression that the heads of Bethesda are a bunch of psychopaths. They seem to have this infantile attitude that is completely at odds with Tim Kaine's vision of what Fallout was supposed to be. You do get speech options with Overseer Elmodovar, so why not with the Vault security guards? According to Officer Kendall's article on the Fallout Wiki, he has a family, including a wife and two daughters. If you kill him or allow him to die to those radroaches, then you aren't just taking his life, but also taking away a husband and a father. Why doesn't the game tell us to consider the value of human life when it comes to his life? If we kill the Overseer, Amada is upset. If you kill him for being a dick, Amata is upset at you. Oh, oh my god! Daddy! The game is using the Overseer's death as a teachable moment. Killing people makes people sad. Aww, maybe killing people's wrong. If Butch's mom dies, Butch is upset. She's dead! She's dead and you could have helped and you didn't! Get away from me! Just go away and leave me alone! Just go away and leave me alone! So why wouldn't Christine, Monica, and Mary Kendall be upset when this man dies? Why doesn't the game take the impact his death has on these people into consideration? Yes, it's fine to have enemies to shoot at in the corridor shooter, if that's all that Fallout 3 is, but isn't Fallout supposed to be something more than that? The developers took the time to give this man a name and tell you who his family is, but then they toss him into a corridor as a generic enemy for you to go pew pew at. And then I can like, you know, pick up his head and put it on his shelf. And I look at it and it's like, I was talking to that person five minutes ago and now I'm not. And your only counter-argument is, you can just run away. Yeah, and leave him to die. Or, if he somehow survives, be chased by a weak-ass, permanently hostile, named, human NPC who may as well be hitting you with a nerf bat. That's really great, Matten. Ten out of ten. That fixes the fucked up morality in the same way that Broken Steel fixes Fallout 3's ending, which is to say that it doesn't. It just avoids the problem, but if your only answer to bad content is to just run past it, then why should this content even exist? He's distracted by the Rad Roaches. In fact, I kind of always assumed that's why the Rad Roaches are there, because he never seems to die to them. Have you ever actually gone back to check? Because I did, and he did die to them. So it's just a good opportunity to run if you want to be more of a pacifist. Coward is more like it. If you want to know what a real pacifist is, you should watch the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Being a pacifist doesn't mean running away and leaving people to die. Many pacifists have put their lives in danger. Some have even lost their lives in order to save the lives of others. 
Come to think of it, isn't that what the ending of Fallout 3 is supposed to be going for? You are expected to lay down your life in order to save the lives of others. Kind of like what James did, though James wasn't a pacifist, because he fully intended to take Autumn and the Enclave soldiers out along with them. James was more like a suicide bomber, detonating an explosive vest in a crowd than an actual pacifist. Fallout 3 is a combat game, first and foremost. If you go out of your way to avoid killing people, it usually means having to run away and avoid massive portions of content in order to do it. That is terrible game design. Or it means relying on gamey methods to get rid of enemies, such as kiting them into other enemies, or having your companions do the work of killing them off. And that isn't really a pacifist approach either, now is it? The game might not log the kills in your stats on your Pip-Boy, but you're still responsible for those deaths, directly or indirectly. New Vegas, on the other hand, added in some interesting non-lethal weapons and ammo types that cause fatigue damage to enemies as opposed to actual damage. Stuff like beanbag rounds for shotguns, or the compliance regulator, or boxing gloves, which knock enemies unconscious as opposed to kill them. It would have been nice if Fallout 3 had options like these on hand in order to get through situations like this without taking someone's life. Of course, even better still would have been if Fallout 3 would have just let you be able to talk Officer Kindle down. If you save his life by killing the Radroaches, that should end his hostility towards you right then and there. The fact that it doesn't is actually quite lame. There's even a specially recorded dialogue option for a martyr to say if you sneak past her interrogation and don't intervene. So the game's fully aware that this could be an option. Are you fully aware that it could be an option to flat out refuse her help right from the start? Neither was I until I started recording some additional footage. If you insist that you don't want Amada's help, she parks her... Too much personality. <laughs> ...down in the chair and waits for you to change your mind, but you can just proceed to the exit without ever going back and talking to her. But wouldn't you know it, she still appears at the exit anyway, regardless. So while it is nice, there are these different dialogue outcomes. That's really all it is. Just some unique dialogue that is of no real consequence. Never mind. It doesn't matter now. What's important is that you made it. You got the door open. And I honestly don't understand how people look at that and think that doesn't feel like a Fallout game in the style of the original games. I don't recall the original Fallout starting you off as an infant or some asinine, sweet roll, pointless filler content. The original Fallout didn't even have a mandatory tutorial at all. It does start off with a cinematic intro where Overseer Jacorin gives you the rundown on the water chip. Ah. You're here. Good. We've got a problem. A big one. The controller chip for our water purification system has given up the ghost. And then we get to play the game. And I'm sorry, but we didn't need any of that information. That is just a massive exposition dump. That is pure telling not showing. And I'm utterly baffled that managed to make it into the final game. Because we don't need any of it. And tasks you with finding a replacement. Nowadays, pretty much every game has a forced tutorial, but back then it was less common, because games back then came with these things called manuals. Fallout 2, on the other hand, does include a forced tutorial. The infamous Temple of Trials tutorial, and Fallout 2 is one of the original Fallouts, but you're not going to hear me defend it. Former members of the Black Isle studio have said in interviews that they didn't want to include the Force tutorial, but it was the publisher, Interplay, that forced the tutorial to be included during the final days of the game's development. While I am a fan of Black Isle and the games they've made, I am not a fan of the publisher, Interplay, breathing down their shoulders and imposing dumb conditions like this Force tutorial. Interplay also ruined Van Buren, which was on course to be completed on schedule, but Interplay abruptly forced Black Isle to include real-time combat in addition to the turn-based mode. This caused an enormous setback in the game's development, and ultimately Interplay went bankrupt and the rest is history. 
While Interplay still technically exists, the reason Bethesda acquired the Fallout franchise and why Interplay went from being a relevant video game company to whatever you might call it nowadays is because of incompetent business decisions forced on the developers. And the Temple of Trials in Fallout 2 is one of those things. Very few people like or defend that tutorial. Not only is it a prison which limits the player's freedom, but the only relevant combat skills are melee and unarmed. There are no small guns, big guns, or energy weapons in the temple. Not that you would expect there to be. So if you tag any of those skills, then you've hamstringed your ability to get through the tutorial. Many players tag melee or unarmed just to get through the tutorial, even though that's not the way they want to build their character or play the game. So it's a really bad thing. Fallout 3 doesn't have meaningful character builds, and the rad roaches and security guards offer no challenge. So in a way, I suppose Fallout 3 manages to get around the problem of Fallout 2's tutorial because you're not going to struggle in Vault 101 if you built your character incorrectly. Just run, or walk at a leisurely pace, with your hands in your pocket, to the vault exit, and nothing is really going to challenge you at all. But, even if Fallout 3 did have challenging enemies, it would then have the same issue Fallout 2's tutorial does of semi-railroading players into certain skills. You see, your combat options are limited to guns, melee, and your bare fists. If you want to be big guns, explosives, or energy weapons, well, too damn bad. You won't find these weapons in Vault 101. To be fair, it does make sense for these sorts of weapons to not be available inside of a vault, but that just further reinforces the argument that the game never should have started out in a vault in the first place. In contrast, though, in New Vegas, Whatever sorts of combat skills you happen to tag in Doc Mitchell's house does impact what sort of loadout you'll start the game off with. By default, you receive a 9mm pistol, but if you happen to tag other combat skills, Doc Mitchell will provide you with alternate weapons based off those skills. Or, if you happen to have repair skill, there's a 9mm submachine gun lying on a crate in a broken condition. I consider New Vegas's tutorial to be the exemplar of how an RPG tutorial should be. If you are making an RPG and you must have a tutorial in it, then do it like how New Vegas did. The New Vegas tutorial feels organic as opposed to contrived. There are no sweet rolls or baby books. It is open as opposed to inside of a sealed linear dungeon. There are ample skill checks all over the place, right from the very start, and best of all, it is all completely optional. Dare I say that not only does New Vegas do it as good as the original Fallouts, it does it even better. At every stage you can solve things with skill checks if you prioritize the right skills. Nope, you're wrong, Matten. There are only three types of skill checks during the tutorial. Speech, science, for hacking the terminal, and lockpicking. Of these three, only speech kinda matters for how you've built your character, but not really, because speech in Fallout 3 is determined by a dice roll. So even if you invest into it heavily, you can still roll badly or have a successful roll even if you didn't invest into speech at all. HBOM covered why this is bad game design in his video. It even tells you the percentage, so you can specialise in speech but not roll properly, while someone else who didn't bother gets lucky with it. Or you can just reload over and over, which completely defeats the point of having speech checks at all. Cumulatively, this is a huge problem for the game as a whole. Conversation is the fundamental medium through which you experience the Fallout universe, and the speech ability is perhaps the most useful and unique thing Fallout ever brought to the table. Messing this up this badly is a game crime. Even without relating to the previous games, it makes this world feel like it's made of tissue paper where if I pass a dice roll, I can totally alter a person's worldview. It's unsubtle and completely ill-fitting for a game series ostensibly based around the nuanced frictions between people. 
H-Bomb nailed quite well what is wrong with the idea that you could change a person's worldview by a dice roll. Thankfully, New Vegas corrects this problem. You either pass the speech check or you don't. And there's a joke option if you don't have the skill required, which makes things more fun. I think Bethesda decided to have speech decided by a dice roll partly because of how incompetent their writers are. It takes good writers to think of the sort of witty dialogue which would sway someone's opinion on something. Emil Pagliarulo just isn't capable of that level of writing. So they decided to rely on speech being decided by a dice roll and being somewhat random. This has the additional bad consequence of encouraging players to reload saves until they succeed. But yes, investing into speech does improve your odds with the dice roll. Unfortunately, increasing your speech skill doesn't make the quality of writing in the dialogue options any more intelligent. In New Vegas and the original Fallouts, if you had low intelligence, there were special dialogue options to reflect that you were a dumb character. Fallout 3, on the other hand, has only dumb dialogue options by default, whether your intelligence is 1 or 10, or whether your speech skill is 5 or 100, the dialogue options are all just as bad. Still better than Fallout 4, though, to be fair, but that's not saying much. New Vegas completely blows Fallout 3's dialogue away. There are a few times in the tutorial where you get to roll the speech dice. Unless I'm missing something, the first happens when Butch is bullying Amada. Later on, you can roll the dice with him again when it comes to the Rad Roaches attacking his mother. It is possible that I'm missing something, but I think that's all of them. Investing into speech helps with the odds of the dice roll, but it isn't necessary when you can just save scum. Not that it is ever necessary anyway, mind you. Lockpicking the door and hacking the terminal are the two other skill checks in the game. Skill checks needs to be in quotations, though, because these are very easy difficulty, which means zero skill is required in order to attempt them. Tagging these or any other skills does not affect anything during the tutorial. And if you haven't, you can search the area to find alternative ways through. You well, you don't have to search too hard because, as H-Bomb showed, the password is right there. To access the Overseer's computer, you could do the hacking minigame, or you could open the drawer directly next to the computer and obtain the password directly. You can blast your way through if you want. Blast your way through with dynamite, like Easy Pete would do? That would be awesome. Unfortunately, you can't. There are no explosives in the tutorial, and the explosive skill never comes into play at all. It would have been epic if you could blast a hole through the vault and make your escape that way. And that huge gaping hole would have the consequence of forcing the vault open to the world, whether the Overseer wants it to be or not. But of course, that would mean a player choice would have actual consequences. And we can't have that, now can we? You can complete the whole area as a pacifist. Except for the mandatory rad roach during the BB gun tutorial. You have no choice not to kill it, because the game won't proceed until you do. Maybe there are gamey workarounds to avoid killing other enemies in the game, but not this one. And after that, you can just run past all the content, which you present as a choice. But that's like saying vegetarians have a choice at a barbecue, because they can just eat the empty hamburger bun with nothing on it. Did you ever think that maybe people want something more than just an empty bun? The entire Fallout 3 tutorial is an empty bun, or, I suppose I should say, a sweet roll. There is nothing here that is of any nutritional value whatsoever. And also, later on in your video, you say that you are the mutant's bad ending. The lone wanderer heads straight there and murders everyone inside it. In Fallout 3, you are the mutant's bad ending. Where the hell is your pacifist solution then, Matten? I honestly don't know what more people want. Honestly, you do know what more people want. It's just that you don't have any good counter-argument to address that, so you pretend that you don't know because it's the only way you could move forward with making your shitty video. There is no possible way that you could have done all the research that you claim you did 
Now, I've spent a lot of time looking into this. I've watched feature length videos and read forum posts the length of academic essays ahead of making this video. And not understand that what people want is choice and consequence. Better writing, character builds, and nuance. I think you are full of shit when you say you honestly don't know what more people want. There's nothing honest about that statement. If you really don't know, then rewatch all of those videos that you claimed you watched until it finally sinks in for you. Perhaps even watch Kretosis' response instead of just skimming through it like you've done. People don't want empty, hollow, nothing burger choices that have no effect on the outcome of the game. They want quests that have branching paths instead of linear quests which are on rails. They want choice, but they want choice which has consequences. Do you understand?